The laws of physics are the same in every reference frame. That statement is often associated with Einstein and the theory of relativity, though it actually uh, predates him by quite a bit. What it means is that any valid statement about physical reality should be evident to everybody, even if they look at a physical process from different angles, or from further away, or from upside down, you should still see the same physical process occurring. Now, uh, the stress tensor is a useful concept for describing the state of forces within a material, and you can find all sorts of excellent videos on YouTube and elsewhere describing the stress tensor. Typically, uh, the stress tensor is described as, as giving us a relationship between a force acting on some surface in a fluid, possibly the surface of the fluid, or possibly uh, a fictitious surface within the fluid, and the vector normal to that surface that describes the orientation of the surface. Uh, what I want to address here is, is a somewhat pickier topic, which is um, the fact that just because we call the stress tensor a tensor doesn't automatically make it a tensor. In order to be a tensor, then the relationship between the inclination of the face and the force acting on it that the stress tensor describes has to be valid in every reference frame. So here's what that relationship looks like. Uh, the force is equal to the unit vector times the stress tensor, or you could equivalently write it as the transpose of the stress tensor times the unit vector, or perhaps most usefully in uh, index notation as the jth component of the force being equal to the ith component of the unit vector times tau ij summed over i according to uh, Einstein's summation convention. So, what we would like to know to address the question of whether the stress tensor really is a tensor or not is what would happen if we looked at this whole relationship in a different reference frame. So here I've tilted the coordinates so that we have e prime 1, e prime 2, and e prime 3 as our coordinate axes in a, in a new Cartesian coordinate system. And then the question becomes, if we measure the force and the unit vector and the stress tensor in this new coordinate system, does this relationship still hold? If it does, then the stress tensor really is a tensor. An equivalent way to phrase the question is to suppose that instead of looking at a coordinate uh, plane, we look at some arbitrary surface that is canted at some angle and cut through the material. So that's what I've done here, is to leave the Cartesian coordinate directions alone, but instead of asking about forces on a coordinate plane, perpendicular to the coordinates, we'll ask about the forces on some arbitrary plane and try to determine whether or not they are described by the stress tensor in the way that it works on coordinate planes. So, let's get started on that. Um, what we're going to do is define a tetrahedron. That's a, a shape with four faces. And one of the faces will be the tilted surface that we just described. And the other three faces will be the faces of the tetrahedron that are perpendicular to the coordinate frame. So face 1 is perpendicular to uh, the coordinate 1, face 2 is perpendicular to 2, face 3 is perpendicular to 3. And these are handily color-coded so you can see the difference. Okay, then the sum of all forces on our tetrahedron will be the force on the tilted surface plus the sum of the forces on the three uh, surfaces that are perpendicular to the coordinate directions. And it's the sum of those forces that we're going to use to test the relationship with the stress tensor and find out whether it really is a tensor or not. Okay, so here we go. Um, what we'll do is we'll 
describe the force on each of those faces using the usual relationship with the stress tensor. So here I'm showing uh, as an example the three face which is perpendicular to the three direction and here is the force acting on it. It's called F3 and it's a vector and it's equal to the unit normal N3 times the stress tensor and then uh, it's the jth component and so we sum over the j indices of the stress tensor and the jth unit vector. We also sum over the dummy index i here and we get the force per unit area, I should point out, uh, acting on the number three coordinate plane. Now since the outward pointing unit normal to the three plane points downward opposite to the uh, three unit vector, then that normal is given by minus delta three i. And when we substitute that, we get that the force on plane three is minus tau three j and acting in the in the jth direction so we sum over all three directions to get the three force factor. We can do that for every plane and add up the results. So what we have here is the force per unit area acting on the tilted plane times its area plus the force per unit area acting on the one plane times its area notice I say plus even though there's a minus sign because it's negative um, then plus the force acting on the two plane over here and plus the force acting on the three plane and the result is the force on the tilted plane times its area minus the sum over j tau ij and the sum over i with dai so it's the sum of the force per unit area on each face of the tetrahedron times the area of each face. And that's going to give us the net force. Okay, and here's that relationship once again. Now what we need to do is take out a common factor of dA. You see we've got a ghost of the relationship we're looking for. We've got something that kind of looks like a force minus something that kind of looks like the stress tensor, but we've got these DAs in the way and we'd like to be able to take them out of there. And we can because DAI is proportional to DA. And that's what I'm going to show you now. Um, down here you see a, a cross section through our tetrahedron that shows two Cartesian coordinate directions and the tilted surface. Okay. And uh, let's see, we're, we're going to be concerned with the Cartesian coordinate direction 1 and the face perpendicular to it, which has area dA1, and with the, the tilted surface, which has area dA. And the angle between them is theta, and from simple trigonometry you can see that dA1 is dA times the cosine of theta. Now there's another relationship here that's also useful for the cosine of theta and, uh, and that relates to the normal vector of the tilted surface which I've sketched up here. And notice that the normal vector to the tilted surface angles away from the vertical at an angle theta. It's the same angle as, as uh, down here. So the Theta is the angle between the normal to the tilted surface and the vertical direction. And the dot product of those two vectors, the normal and the vertical unit vector, is equal to the product of their areas times the cosine of the angle between them, like the dot product of any vectors. In this case, the dot product is simple because the lengths of these two vectors are both 1 and so all you have is the cosine of theta. So the cosine of theta is n hat dot e1. And note further that the dot product of this normal vector 
with the one unit vector is just the one component of the normal vector. So cosine theta can be replaced in this equation up here with n1. And here we go. So a1, dA1, the, uh, the area of the one surface, is equal to n1 times dA, the area of the tilted surface. And this same argument works with all of the other coordinate faces also. So dAi is ni dA. And you can see how that's going to allow us to have dA as a common factor on the right-hand side of this expression for the net force. Okay, so here's our expression for the net force, and here we go. We can substitute for dAi, uh, Ni, dA, and that whole thing is the net force, and so it has to add up to the mass of the tetrahedron times its acceleration, just by Newton's second law of motion. The mass of the tetrahedron will be the density of the material, rho, times the volume of the tetrahedron, which is assumed to be small, and so we call it dv. So rho dv is the mass of the tetrahedron, and mass times acceleration is equal to the net force. Okay, we're, we're zeroing in on the answer here. Uh, we can take out dA from that equation, and also we'll just take the jth component of this equation up here. So we've done two things. We've taken out dA as a common factor, and we've isolated the j component. And what we get is the jth component of the vector f minus tau ij and i equals rho times dv over dA times the jth component of the acceleration. Now you should notice this is starting to look a lot like the relationship that uh, may be true for the stress tensor if the right-hand side of this relationship is zero. And so our final job is to convince ourselves that the right-hand side here really is zero. And, and that's not obvious because it's just the jth component of the acceleration times the mass, and there's no reason why this tetrahedron couldn't go scooting off and, and accelerate as a result of these forces acting on it. But we'll show, in fact, that even if that happens, the right-hand side of this equation is zero, basically because the tetrahedron is small enough that its mass goes to zero. So, here we go. First notice, the volume of any three-dimensional shape is proportional to L cubed, where L is any length scale. So you can define L as the length or the width or the radius or anything else you might want depending on the, the three-dimensional shape that you're interested in, and the volume will always come out to be proportional to L cubed. And similarly, the area, and that could be any area of a three-dimensional shape, its surface area or cross-sectional area or whatever, will always come out to be proportional to the square of your length scale. And I'll show you a couple of examples just to, to fix that idea. Suppose that the three-dimensional shape that you're interested in is a cube. And the cube has got a volume, and it's got a surface area, and each of its edges has length L. In that case, the volume of the cube is simply equal to L cubed, so it's proportional to L cubed with proportionality constant 1. The total surface area of the cube is 6 times L squared, so the area is proportional to the square of the length scale. And notice finally that as a result, the ratio of the volume to the area is proportional to L. In this case, the proportionality constant is 1 sixth. The same thing is true of a sphere. Here's a sphere. It has radius R, uh, a surface area A, and a volume V. The volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed, so it's proportional to the cube of the length scale, which in this case is chosen to be r, and then the proportionality constant is 4 thirds pi. The total surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So the ratio, you'll notice, of the volume to the surface area 
is proportional to r. It's one-third r. So in either of these cases, if we took the length scale to zero, then the ratio of volume to area would go to zero. The limit of volume over area as L goes to zero, well, the ratio of volume to area is proportional to that L, and so it goes to zero too. Or in the case of the sphere, volume over area is proportional to radius. If you take the radius to zero, you also get zero. So, if this is true for any three-dimensional shape, then it's true for our tetrahedron. And so we've shown that the right-hand side of this equation has to be zero because the volume per unit area of our three-dimensional shape, again, in this case a tetrahedron, it goes to zero. And therefore, the left-hand side must also be zero, and the relationship between the force on the arbitrarily tilted surface and its unit normal is described in the usual way by the stress tensor, and now we're happy because we've shown that the stress tensor really is a tensor, and we can go around calling it that without worrying. So, there we go.